what we're doing right now is starting a new series. Basically, it's from the pastor's heart series. I didn't want to call it that because that would be a little bit long of a title, and then I would have to come up with a logo for it. But I just wanted to share my heart for the next few weeks, possibly months. Those who are new with us, all of 2019, we went verse by verse through the 28 chapters of Matthew. So trust me, we love getting into the word. But right now, I want to preach things from my heart. It may be from politics. It may be from what I see on your Facebook. Amen. Half kid. It, it, may, it may come from what's going on around the neighborhood. I don't know where a God might lead me, but I know he's going to speak to us through the word as we take a break from a longer series. And if you stick around a while, trust me, we'll get back into a book of the Bible, verse by verse by verse. If you're missing that, there's probably ones you've never heard before. Did you know I've preached Habakkuk? Do you know I've preached Timothy? By God's grace, I've preached a lot of books of the Bible. You can go back and listen to those. Over a thousand messages all online for free on the app for you. So today what I wanna talk about something that's been in my heart for a while. I've been trying to piece it together. I believe by God's grace, it's going to be good for us. Before we go to the scripture, I want to stick with this title for a minute and ask you if you can identify with where I'm at about living lawful, obeying God's commands in a time of lawlessness. It seems like the world has gone crazy. It seems like everything I was taught was wrong as a kid is now acceptable. I was driving Lyft the other day, and I picked up a customer from the weed store. Now weed is legal in our city. I could only imagine what I would have done with that when I was a kid. And he told me while he was there buying weed, it was all sold out. It was all gone. See, that was told, I was told that was wrong when I was growing up. Now it's okay. Also, the things that we used to have to sneak around my house to look at, whether it be pornography or a, or a vile video, I had to sneak around to see those things. Now they're putting it on network television. Perversion, nudity, homosexuality, orgies, sharing of partners, this kind of sexual perversion is now out in the open. Also, when I was growing up, abortion, and by the way, I turned 43 this month, so I'm not too old, but old enough to be around a while. When I was growing up, nobody boasted in having an abortion. Of course, it got legal in the 70s, but nobody would have been proud about it. Even back then, they knew it was wrong, and they were somehow forced into that, but they were doing it regrettably. Just last week at the Golden Globes, an actress boasted in her abortion and said because of that, she could be who she is. Isn't it something how things have changed? What I think happened in the 60s was the hippies won. And I don't just mean that to be funny. I mean it to be serious. Before the 60s, you had the 50s, one of the most conservative times in America's history. As a matter of fact, the logo, In God We Trust, was put on our money. People were going to church more than ever before. If you look at most of your neighborhood churches, aside from the Roman Catholic ones, most of those Protestant churches were all built around that time. You know the neighborhood Chicago brick church I'm talking about, fits about 100 people, has a kitchen, a basement. Most of those were built in the 50s, coming right into the early 60s. Now they're being sold to cafes, art galleries, and mosques. What happened? Well, in the 60s, they wanted sex without consequences. Now we have that in our culture. Those hippies grew up and became our college professors. They became our governors and leaders. Those who were smoking pot now are making the laws. And so the hippies, they wanted sex without consequences. And so in the 70s, they made abortion legal. Now you don't have to worry about having kids. They began to promote promiscuity. The condom era came in so you could avoid all your STDs. Sadly, the AIDS epidemic showed that people weren't using them, but now they're back on track to getting that together so still sex is free and fair and as long as nobody gets hurt, do as much as you want. The hippies wanted to do drugs. Now the cities are starting to legalize drugs. The hippies wanted you to choose your own sexuality. Now you can do that as well. And of course, some of these famous people from that era, like, um, like Bruce Jenner, who was an Olympian, is now a woman, supposedly. And you might feel like me, 
Kind of like Captain America, if you follow that in the movies. Captain America was from the 50s. He got iced up and woke up in the modern era and didn't understand it. I feel like almost the crazies have taken over the, the institute. It would be okay to a sense if it didn't impact all of our children and our jobs. If it was just people doing what they want, it's okay to be wicked in my worldview. If you want to go to hell, that's up to you. But it's not just they came out of the closet. They have now pushed us into the closet. Every time they have gotten something new that they wanted, we lose something. For example... We had prayer at the beginning of every public school day, pledging allegiance. You could pray and say one nation under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. Nobody got upset. You could pray at the football game. You could pray as a valedictorian. You could pray as a teacher during life's tragedies. But when they had their worldview put into the schools, prayer went out and metal detectors came in. And now if you pray as a valedictorian, you can get in trouble as a teacher. If you pray, you can get in trouble. And so they've outlawed what once used to be legal. Have you noticed a lot of good things are now being called bad? And not only that, now with smoking marijuana, people from any profession can do this as a hobby. They don't have to be ashamed of it, buy it from a drug dealer. Your doctor can be getting high right now and come to do your surgery tomorrow. After all, it's legal. And so now they want you to think you're wrong if you say, I want a doctor who doesn't smoke weed. They want you to feel bad if at your corporation they say, we're celebrating Pride Month, everybody wear rainbow colors, they're going to say, your job is in jeopardy if you say, I'm not down with that. What I would say is, I'm going to wear the rainbow, but just have a different symbol, a uh, sign for that symbol. That's the symbol of God's judgment upon the earth and everything working out. That's why I'll wear the rainbow. Have you noticed it, though, that now you're being pushed into the closet? You're not just now being told you have a differing opinion. Your opinion can cost you your job. Uh, your boss was once named Bob, and now he comes in wearing makeup and wants to be called Barbara. If you don't call Bob dressing up like Barbara, a woman being called Barbara, if you don't do that, you can lose your job. All of our teachers here, all of our police officers, military, those of you working in governmental jobs, social workers, all of you are within a hair's breadth of being fired if you don't comply to what now they have said is law. And here's the thing. They want you out of there. They've already said it in their corporate meetings. We want everyone to comply or to get out. So you as a teacher, you might see that little girl, Debbie, now she wants to be known as Dan. If you don't call Debbie Dan, you're going to lose your job, and they're happy for it because they're going to give that job to someone who thinks just like them. You don't want to bake that cake for the gay wedding? They want you out of the community, and they want to bring in their bakers. They win. It's a strategy. They've had it for quite a while. As a matter of fact, these grown-up hippies who are now our lawmakers wrote about this while they were in college. Obama wrote about things like this. Hillary Clinton wrote about things like this. Many of them said in their times of youth, this is what our utopian society will look like. We'll get rid of the male leadership. We'll get rid of marriage as a contract. We'll get rid of looking down upon drugs and sexual perversion and abortion. We'll get rid of a Christian idea of God being only through Jesus or Jesus being the only way to God. And now today, let's look around. Let's, let's not even do it based on our own assumptions. Let's just do it based on fact. From 1955 to 2020, have things changed? Now, ask yourself this, is our culture better or worse? Is there more suicide or less suicide? Is there more mental illness or less mental illness? Is there, is there more addiction or less addiction? Is there more STDs or less STDs? Why haven't they woke up then? 
Why haven't they realized their mistake? Why haven't they stepped back and go, oh, hold on, this is not working. We're affirming the LGBTQ community more than we've ever done before, but now they're dying more than they've ever done before. Why, why hasn't our affirmation changed them? See, they try to blame it on us in the church and say, your, your condemnation of them, you calling it sin, is causing them to commit suicide. Well, everybody in the 50s believed it was a sin, but where was the suicide rate? Now when they're the most accepted, they're all over entertainment and politics, running even for president, but now they're committing suicide. Why doesn't it line up? Back in the 50s, having transgender sex assignment was only if you were a hermaphrodite, born with different genders in your DNA, and the doctors had to figure it out. Now people with healthy genders are changing their genders and are committing suicide more than ever before. Why didn't the transgenders commit suicide in the 50s? How were they able to cope and why now are they not able to cope? Drugs, remember in the 50s, it was illegal. It was wrong to even chew gum in school. Now they're smoking pot in front of the school. And yet that was supposedly making drugs legal was to take away all the addictions. And yet now people are more addicted to their drugs than ever before. It almost seems like we thought the more we got in the mud, we would be clean, but now we're realizing we're just more dirty. And no one wants to, at least in public, Ellen Degenerate, I mean Degenerist, and all of these do not want to come back and go, maybe we skipped something here. Maybe we forgot something along the way. Maybe while we were switching worldviews, changing the way we were going to live, we lost something. But Christians, we need to be aware of this. We need to be aware of what has changed and what has been lost. And so the first thing is, is we need a wake-up call. And today in church, I want to give you that wake-up call. Christians, listen, we lost the culture war. We lost. We lost it. What our parents treasured, what they kept sacred, what they handed down to us has now been lost. It's over. We are now a defeated culture. They say on estimates that around 70% lowest than ever before people claim to be Christian. The highest group is a none, none of the above. Those are growing 10, 15, 20% of the population. We are now 70% checking off Christian. But here's the problem. Our statisticians like George Barna and Think Like Jesus, his book, or in Dickerson's book, The Evangelical Recession, talks about once we talk to the 70% and ask them basic Christian questions, like, do you believe the Bible's the word of God or just written by men? Or, uh, you know, just a book about men's opinions or inspired, you know, by, by men's ideas about God. Or do you think Jesus is the only way to heaven or just one of the ways to heaven? We have now found out that only between 4 and 10% of Americans actually believe what Billy Graham taught or what Christians have always believed. So they still may check off they're a Christian, but when you're on your job, out of those 100, only four of them believe what you believe right now. We have lost the culture war. The public schools have been taken over by the worldview of a non-Christian mindset. The universities, non-Christian mindset. And some of you just think to yourself, well, that's just the way it should be. You don't even understand how these universities got here. Most of these were founded by pastors and Christians and leaders, and their main job was to teach people to be outstanding Christians, even the one here in Chicago. You look up the founding of Northwestern by Christians. And so you might think to yourself, well, that's just the way it should be because we don't want Muslims taking over our public schools, and we don't want you know, Hindus, so just keep religion out of it. No, here was the thing. Religion was always a choice of the people in a democracy, but the majority of those in that democracy could have schools that reflected what they believed. So when the majority of us were Christians, it was right to reflect our Christian belief. There would be nothing wrong in praying because the majority of us were praying. That's why, by the way, before Congress, we have a chaplain. 
And that's why they swear on the Bible, not the Quran. So it doesn't have to be separation of church and state in the way you believe. Separation of church and state is the way you live. You don't have to go to my church. You don't have to believe in God. That's right. But you can't interfere with me believing in God. And when the majority of us at our founding believed in God, we put the Bible in our courtrooms. We put prayer before our congressional meetings. We put Christians in places of power and did not apologize for their worldview. Now, I know some of you here are a little woke. And so you might think to yourself, well, pastor, also during that time when Americans were the highest rate of Christians, they were also slave owners or practicing Jim Crow laws. Yes, but who fixed that problem? Who fought in the Civil War for the freedom of the slaves? Muslims? No, because they were owning slaves at that same time and still do to this day. Who fought in the Civil War? Hindus? No, they still practice the caste system even to this day. Who fought in that war? Buddhists? No, they're still practicing their false religion and oppressing their own people in places like China and so forth. Who fought in the Civil War against the hypocritical Christians? Other genuine Christians. During the time of Jim Crow, who stood up and marched down the streets of Montgomery, Atlanta, Chicago? Was it Muslims? No, some of them were there, but who was the majority of them? Reverend Martin Luther King. Christians marching with Christians to bring change to a society that wasn't living Christian. That's why when you talk to African-American leaders like Martin Luther King Jr.'s niece and others like my friend, Pastor Thomas Gross, who's lived in the South as an African-American man, he's in his 60s, and his father, who he tells stories about, who marched with King, they will tell you, we were Christian. We were married to our wives. We took care of our children. We had outstanding characteristics in our homes and in our neighborhoods, and that's why we wanted equality. Not so they could listen to gangster rap, smoke weed, and fill up the prisons. You see, everybody's culture is degraded by sin. You can listen because we've got a lot of scriptures to go to, but listen to Proverbs 14.34. It says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. So was the African-American community better in 1955 or worse than it is today? Better. Was the Anglo community in 1955 better or worse? Better. Lower suicide, lower addiction. How about all of these other things? The Latino community, the Asian community. In America, sin has disgraced all of our people. You used to talk to a Latino and you'd ask them how many kids they have or what kind of family they grew up in. And what would they say? Mucho, right? They would say many. They would be like, I I come from a family of eight. How many of your grandparents came from a family of more than four or five kids? Now you talk to Latinos, hardly any any kids. Why? Because Latinos are are leading the abortion industry in places like Chicago and and certain neighborhoods, as well as the African-American community. You're committing genocide against your own people. Where did Planned Parenthood come from? Planned Parenthood came from Margaret Sanger, a slave activist, a woman who wanted slavery and wanted to wipe out minorities. She was a white supremacist. And yet they got you minorities woke supporting Planned Parenthood in your neighborhood. You are literally supporting the Ku Klux Klan by a different name. And yet the Christian says, we want you not to abort your child, and you think we're infringing on your rights. You say, my body, my choice. Well, guess what? What goes in the trash when you walk out of there is not your body. It has a separate DNA. So let's live by your rules and not your body, not your choice. So get your hands off that body in your body. Amen. Even if you were raped and you don't feel qualified to be a mom, we'll take care of you. We'll help provide for your needs and we'll find a great family for your child to be adopted. And don't make yourself a murderer out of being raped. You were raped. That is tragic. We weep with you. We want the rapist to die, not your child. Amen? We want you to live and your child to live. 
And thank God for those who have come out of those terrible situations. Just look up online those who were birthed out of rape. You will be surprised at world leaders, inventors, scholars who came from that. How many are we now missing in our culture because we murdered them for nine months of convenience? Of course, I don't understand what it feels like to have children. I get the man flu and think I'm dying of the bubonic plague. I know I can't understand, ladies, but I give you credit for being able to birth the child. May God give you grace to carry it through. And multiple women here have had abortions and have been forgiven. And now they look back at it with the eyes of Christ and they see the terrible thing that it was. And they don't want any woman to go through that, especially the young ladies. May God bless you as you bear children. We could be here all day talking about how bad it is, but what do we do in the midst of evil? When we walk into a room and you turn on the light, supposedly it's supposed to go on. Somebody's supposed to have put a light bulb in there. If it doesn't go on, what do you do? Do you start just cursing and not do anything about it? No, you switch the light bulb. We could get mad at the darkness and that the church hasn't turned on yet, and we can sit here and just curse about it or get upset about it, or we can change the light. I want to know, does anybody here want to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth? I want to know, does anybody want to change the way we do church, change the way we live? Because I want to tell you something. I was just as worldly as they were before I came to Christ. When I saw my friends in the church I was brought up in protesting against abortion as I was driving by with my friends to go skateboarding, I honked the horn, stuck out my fanny, and mooned them, flicked them off, and cussed them out. I remember calling up prayer lines on TV that I would get from TV acting like I was demon-possessed. I used to sell drugs behind the church that I would go to, make out with girls in the church bathroom. I was a worldly person, too. What changed my mindset from loving drugs, loving porn, loving all that's in this world? Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do is not turn people on just to following rules for rules sake. I want to turn people on to Jesus. And I want to show them that there's a better way. There's a better way for those who are struggling over their sexual identity. There's a better way for those of you who want to get high all the time. There's a better way for those of you here who think killing your child is the best way out. There's a better way. And it's the law of God. The Bible says the law of God is a light to our path. The law of God is in the word of God. And it blesses us. It comes without a burden. Of course, I've had sex without being married. I had to go to the clinic a couple times because of it. What I experience now in my wife, coming on 15 years with six children, cannot compare to any one-night stand or any sex that I ever had with anybody else. (laughs) Marriage is the answer for sexual confusion and sexual desire. It's settled in marriage. Marriage is God's blessing for the sexual perverted. How about drugs? I used to do drugs all the time. But now I understand there's no high like the most high. Give Jesus a try. Listen, you can smoke weed and come down. You can pop a pill and come down. You get yourself Jesus. You're not coming down. You're going from glory to glory to glory. Hallelujah. There's a reason why there's a lot of former drug addicts in this place. We're not hiding anything from you. Yeah, it felt good at first. It did. It felt good at first, but then it started to rot my mind and my brain and take away motivation. And all the crimes that I committed, I was either drunk and or high at the same time. It corrupted me. Find truth. And why you're getting drunk or high. Do you not like yourself? Do you not like the sober mind and the thoughts that you have? Well, then let God change your mind. Don't put on rose-colored glasses while the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Change the world in which you live. I'm not here to play make-believe. The same problems are still here. But I have have a God-sized solution to all the problems in this world. And his name is Jesus. We could be here all day, but we have to get beyond just talking about it. We've got to be the solution. Can I hear an amen? amen? Amen. That's the first introduction. Let's go to 2 Peter. There's going to be two introductions, and then there's going to be two lists of points. Are you ready? 
Amen. By God's grace, we'll do it. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. The Bible is teaching us what it's going to be like in the end times. And if you have time, read all of chapter 3. Peter is making his appeal to those people, and he is saying, judgment is coming on this earth, but it's going to take time. And people in the end, at the end of the earth, they're going to think it's never coming. And they're actually going to mock you and say, where's this judgment we've heard about? Ages have passed and it's never come. I don't think God's ever going to judge us. He said, they don't understand. A thousand years is like a day to the Lord. So think about it like this, my friends. How many days was Jesus in the tomb for? Three days, right? If a 1,000 years is like a day, we've already had 2,000 years of human history. What are we now starting the third day? Jesus rose on the third day. When's he coming back? On the third day. This is the, the last millennium. I can guarantee you that. I can guarantee you that we're not going to see 3,000. No, we might see 980 more years. We might see only two more years. We might not even have two more minutes. But I can tell you this. This is the last 1,000-year time here to get it right. The Bible says he is coming back, but he's coming back like a thief in the night. He's going to surprise and shock many people. Now listen to how Peter ends his chapter here and the letter. It's so important. He says, therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, somebody say, I've been warned. Thank you. Be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawlessness and fall from your secure position. He's talking to Christians, and he's saying, don't fall from your secure position by the error of lawlessness. He said, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. That is the end of his letter, but how powerful is that? Now, I want you to get this because we have had a lot of great preachers come through our generations in America and throughout the ages and tell us, Jesus is coming back. Get ready. Get ready. But I want to tell you, we are now seeing things that they never saw. When Christianity started, it was countercultural. It was radical. We think now going to church makes your parents happy. That's changing. Parents don't want a lot of their kids to come to church. We have a young lady at Taft High School. We have reached her. She loves Jesus. She wants to come. She came one time and she said, she told her dad what the messages were about. And her dad said, you can't go anymore. But listen, we're not the first ones to be in this kind of position. In the Roman Empire where Christianity was birthed, they crucified our Jesus. They started to kill the apostles, and they martyred them for over 300 years. It was against the law to become a Christian. But around the early 300s, the emperor bowed his knee and claimed Christ as Lord and made Rome a Christian nation. What happened in those 300 years? Did we fight wars like the Muslims to establish ourselves? Did we, did we conquer the culture by, by being like the Hindus and suppressing everybody? No, we were an underground movement, a revolution. Even though it was illegal, we still taught about Christianity. Do you know the sign, the fish, that you've seen maybe on Christian graphics? That was actually a way if you were in the town square traveling, looking for Christians, and you found somebody that you thought might be one, but you weren't sure, you would just kind of move your foot on the ground with a half of a moon shape like that. And if the person you were talking to then completed the fish, you would say, where's our service in this town? It was an underground way of meeting uh, your fellow believers in Christ. As a matter of fact, most of our precious art in that time is found in our tombs, in the caves, because they were having church there. They were burned alive. They were eaten by wild animals because the culture had one rule. One rule. Rome, as wicked as it was, had one rule to rule all of its wickedness. You can do whatever you want, as long as you don't think what you're doing is greater than what we're doing. You can worship gods, but your God cannot be greater than our God. That's fine if you have your own God, but your God can't be greater than our God. You can do sexual perversion. Roman soldiers would actually take children from the places they conquered and make them as their sex slaves. 
Children following Roman soldiers in pederasty was allowed. Emperors were having orgies. As a matter of fact, in our Bible, it warns you against orgies. And when I used to read that 20 or 30 years ago, people were like, oh, you said the word orgy. Oh, my goodness. But in their culture, that was literal people in their church. Bible talks about temple prostitution, where people in the name of their goddess would sell their bodies for sex to give offerings to that goddess. And so what happened in that culture? Christians didn't turn off their light. Christians began to live so much like Christ that they would kill them. See, Oprah Winfrey's version of Christianity never would have succeeded in Rome because it just would have fit into all the other pantheon of gods. It was the God of the Bible that demanded he be the only way, not one of the ways. And it was that belief that caused it to grow so powerfully even unto death. You've heard the term Roman candle, shoot them off as fireworks. They were torture devices of Rome. Impale the person with a staff or a stick, put them on the side of the road, douse them with oil, set them on fire. When people come in and out of the road, they're warned not to be like this person. Nero did that to hundreds of Christians. He celebrated their deaths. When we look back into our history, we see that now we're facing a time that they we're familiar with, but we're doing it from the opposite angle. Let me explain. When they first became the church, as the Holy Spirit came, there was only a few thousand. So as they were moving forward, they were always countercultural, but they were never the majority. So when we hear in this scripture, don't be carried away by lawlessness, don't fall from your position, that would have been almost impossible in that generation to see a mass falling away because they were so small out of the population. Now in the end times, the Bible talks about a mass falling away, people falling for the air of lawlessness. What must you have for a mass falling away? A mass population of Christians. So now for the first time in Western civilization, in the history of the church, Christian populations are no longer going up. They're now going down. They are falling. Do you understand that? For the very first time, you are a part of a generation of Christians who are no longer growing, but are now dying. Why are they dying? Why are Christians turning away from Christ, becoming atheists, other religions? It's because they're falling for the error of lawlessness. Now, thankfully, around the world in non-Christian cultures like the Middle East and Africa and Latin America, where the gospel hasn't reached, these people are growing. And so overall, Christianity is still growing because of that and its birth rates. But the places in Europe, the places some in other places, parts of Latin America, the places in America where Christianity was dominant is now sliding down that slippery slope because of the error of lawlessness. Come on, somebody say, teach him. Can I tell you what the error of lawlessness looks like? I'm just to make it plain. It looks like a pastor's kid coming out to his dad that he's gay. And his dad says, you know, we don't believe that here. And the son starts to cry and says, Dad, but it's all that I want to be, and it feels so natural. The father, who's a pastor, goes to his Bible, looks at those scriptures that he once believed, and then he says, oh, no, this can't be true. My son, who I love so much, says this is what he was born to be. I must have gotten this wrong because God wouldn't do that to one of his precious children. And then now that son becomes a singer, goes on a show like American Idol or America's Got Talent, and the backstory is told, and there the father comes out with his son proud as ever. This is my gay son. He's a Christian just as much as I am. I love and accept him. I'm so happy for him. And then the judges wipe away the tears from their eyes and say, oh, that's so touching. Have you ever noticed that when these celebrities go on these shows to play for a charity. It's always for Planned Parenthood or the LGBT after school program. No one ever says, I'm playing for Metro Praise. I'm praying for pro-life organization. No, it's always in that agenda, isn't it? 
And so they all applaud. God bless you, pastor. See, that's the error of lawlessness. It's so deceiving, isn't it? Because it's almost like you feel that if you say homosexuality is a sin to your son, put yourself in the pastor's position, that you're saying you don't love him, that you're saying you don't care about him. And so now you're torn between these two two feelings. I care about him, but I care about the Bible. I care about him, but I care about the Bible. The Bible says it's wrong, but I feel so right. Maybe the Bible is wrong, or maybe I understood it wrong. Quick fix, right? Here's another error of lawlessness. The error of lawlessness is like your neighbor. They're Muslim. And the wife, she dresses so conservative. She really is just a sweetheart. The neighbor, uh, this family is just amazing. And so you invite them over for dinner and you start to hear their faith. And you don't know many Muslims or haven't heard too much about Islam, but you start to hear about the beauty of their prayer and their chants and their moral stances. They stand for justice and they stand for equality and they, and they want all people to get along. And all of a sudden, you start to feel this love for them. And then you say to yourself, how dare I say their religion is wrong? After all, God is a big God. And just like there might be many streams that come into one river, this would probably just be a stream, and Christianity is another stream, just coming into one river called God. God would not allow this precious, sweet family to go to hell just because they were in a different stream. Let me look back at this Bible. Maybe maybe I had it wrong. And then you come to your life group and you say, I won't be able to attend here anymore because you guys teach you're the only right religion. I don't want to put down my Hindu neighbors, my Muslim neighbors. I have now made some great friendships with them. And so I'm choosing to believe that God's grace is this big and can fit in everybody. And of course, if you told that story on Oprah's show, oh, she would just applaud for you and she would say, you got it, girl. That was your aha moment. Just aha, you got it, right? We're all in this together. Sounds so good, doesn't it? But what happens when we go back to the Bible? Number one, it's written by the martyrs. Paul was beheaded. Peter crucified upside down. And they were martyred for saying the exact opposite. They were not saying, you Romans are great. You have your gods. We have ours. Let's live in peace. No, they were saying, you Romans are deceived by Satan. This is a way to hell. Christ is the only way to heaven. Kill him. Kill her. Kill him. Number one, it was written by martyrs. So you read it and you have one of two choices. You either make the law of God your way of managing your emotions or you let your emotions manage the word. So now you come in with your emotional glasses and you go, well, that couldn't mean that and that couldn't mean that. Well, that couldn't mean, because you're reading it through your emotions. But if you read it through the word of God spoken by God, letting the text speak for itself, it will tell you what it's saying. See, Peter's way around falling for the error of lawlessness was to grow in grace and knowledge. Why why do I not sin like I used to? Because I grew in grace and knowledge about sin. I could have easily did what my friends are now doing. Weed is good. Homosexuality is good. Abortion is great. Sex outside of marriage, ah, get over it. It's old-fashioned. Or I can grow actually in the grace of God that was purchased by Jesus on the cross, not as a license to keep sinning, but a license to get out of sin. I could grow in the knowledge of why sin exists, why perversion exists, why religions exist, and understand who Jesus is more than I understand anything else. You see, when I grow in that, I am safe from the error of lawlessness. 
It's like my wife working at a bank. They taught her the real deal because once you know what a bill is like, a dollar bill, a 20 bill, you won't fall for the counterfeit. Once you grow in the knowledge and the grace of God, you won't fall for the counterfeit. So you might say, Pastor, well, what do we say to our, to our children who maybe come out as, as gay or lesbian? What do we say to our neighbors who are of a different religion? We say we love them. We say Christ loves them, but then we show them the error of their lawlessness. We say, here's the law. It's the law of God. It's pretty basic. There's a reason why 1,900 years of Christianity have affirmed these things, even among all denominations. So even though we tease our Roman Catholics for praying to saints and Mary and all that, and even though there's different churches meeting today, there's been a reason why we all have agreed on this for almost 2,000 years until somebody real smart, I guess, in, in North America figured out what Paul really meant. Uh, we let the text speak for itself, and then we say, here's the law, and, and you're over here. And this is what you can do. You can repent. And re Penance means you come from where you are back to where God is. You change your mind about what you're thinking. You don't ask God to change his mind. You change your mind, and you march your little behind right back over here, just like the rest of us did, and then you live for Jesus. And you walk the path that's called the what? The straight and narrow. And then what did Jesus say? What did he say about that? Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. All of Oprah and all of her favorite authors are on that gate because there's enough room for them, right? Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many are that, are that be on it. Many of today's Christians are on that. But if we grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, we'll never be duped for the lie. That's why when I hear about new cults and new things, and I could freak you out, we have children here, about how gross and perverted some of these new religious beliefs are. One of them, in particular, just blew my mind that people even do it. It's in New York. People pay a lot of money for it, and it's all based on perversion, and they think they're so spiritual, but it's because they didn't have the grace and knowledge of God. I don't stop sinning because I'm afraid of hell, guys. I stop sinning because God showed me how great grace is. It's not really, come on, guys. It's not that weed is so much better than the sober life. No, dude, the sober life with Jesus is better than what weed could ever give me. It's not like abortion is so cool, I'm just not cool and I don't do it. It's like children are really, really cool and I want as many as I can have. I'll even adopt yours before you murder him or her. Are you listening to me? And, and I say this with all due respect. It's not that LGBTQ and all of those things are just so awesome and we're just so fuddy-duddies. No, it destroys your mind and your body. It puts things in wrong places. It takes you away from having your own children with your own DNA. It takes away sexual reproduction, a safety in the home for the fa female and male identity. It does so many destructive things. I don't want you to experience it. Oh, and by the way, we have a lot of former lesbians, bisexual, and even some people transitioning or trying to be a different gender, and they're more passionate about this subject than I am. And it's something when we're out preaching on the streets, and they say in Logan Square, I used to be a lesbian, and then they tell their story. It is just as if they just dropped an atomic bomb on that place. That whole place erupts because the one thing that this generation cannot take is a counter view. They want the echo chamber. They, they want to be in their mind left to hear the echoes of what they've already said. Lesbianism is awesome. Lesbianism is awesome. Lesbianism is awesome. Lesbian. They don't want to hear a lesbian go, lesbianism is not awesome. Because the moment that breaks the echo, lesbian is awesome. Lesbianism is awesome. Lesbianism is not awesome. They all turn on that person. Yeah. And they go, bad, bad, bad. And they all want to point at that person as being bad. But then here's the thing. Here's the thing. I thought we were supposed to have diversity. But you see their hypocrisy now, don't you? You see, for us as Christians, we don't want to force them to do something they don't want to do. That is true, is it not? In 1955, did you have to pray if you didn't want to? No. If you come to my house or I go to your house and you're not a Christian, do you have to pray with me? No, I'm just going to ask, can I pray before the meal? Been there and done that with awkward stares. But do you have to? No. Do, do you have to even swear on the Bible? No, as long as you say you're going to tell the truth. Do you have to have the chaplain uh, after the chaplain prays? Do you have to agree with them? No. But the whole point is we now are being told we can't even do what is natural for us as Christians to do. 
You can still do that. That's up to you if you want to do that. But why is it now you think what I'm saying is hate speech? Why is it what you're thinking I'm saying is now uh, somehow inciting you to violence? It's not. It's just a differing opinion. And here's a hint to this generation. If you can't handle a differing opinion, that shows your immaturity. The philosophers in the Greek time said it's someone's, to someone's maturity that they can hold a differing view even if they don't agree with it, to think it over and to rationalize through it. Amen? Instead of just shouting down people you disagree with, get out the hate, get out the hate, you know, and pushing us off to the sidewalk or, or pushing us off the sidewalk or getting the police to shut us down when we're preaching. It's amazing how many people are supposedly woke, but when someone else is more woke than them, they want to shut them down and go back to sleep. It's like, hold on, I thought you guys were woke. Now woke is shouting in front of our gospel truck, we're hate mongers? No. The Bible says that they'll do this. It's just like a child plugging its ears because they don't want to hear the truth. But let's us not let them be our excuse because I can fall into sin. Can I give you one more error of law on this list in the second introduction here? I told you I got two introductions. Can I give you one more? Yeah. Let me tell you the error in the pastor. The pastor who says, you know what? I've always had same-sex attractions. And my wife understands. Actually, a bishop came out like this. You can look him up online. He came before his church and he said, my wife has told me she understands. She's known I've been frustrated in the marriage. And so we're going to have a divorce. And after we divorce, I'm going to start dating men. And I just want you to know I'm going to love you and be your pastor as I've always been. Do you know that people stayed with that church? As a matter of fact, I had put up another church of an African-American bishop who was homosexual. And I said, watch the service and see if you can tell any difference. Now, I grew up in the South in the ministry, so I love the style of African-American church, the clapping, the shout, and all that. So it was cool in that way, but you never would have known the man preaching was homosexual. Now, here's the error. If all your Christianity is, is surface level, basically uh, one-liners like that come from Oprah, you know, speak your truth, you know, make sure you're happy in life, do the best for you. If that's how you think of Christianity, what do you see now when you see that? You're, you're like, man, that's all, that's his truth. Of course I got to support him. I'm going to stay in my church. I'm not leaving this person now. Or my bishop's gay. So what? Everybody has their own thing that they do. And see, the error of lawlessness always comes with the deception of this is better. Do you think the person right now is honestly saying to themselves, I'm lawless and going to hell? No, they think they're better than us. Like they're smarter than us. And they figured it out. And you guys just... You haven't caught up yet. Have you ever talked to anybody like that yet that's looked down their nose on you like, you just haven't figured it out yet. I used to be, I used to be just like you. I went to a church just like your church. You can get smart like me. Doesn't that sound like Satan though a little bit? You can be a God. Come on over here. You'll see it our way. Let's get into the, the message. Are you guys ready? Amen. Let's go to the book of Daniel. How many know Daniel had to live in times like this? The Jewish people were conquered by the Babylonians. They were forced to leave Jerusalem and come to Babylon. They were forced to leave their place of safety and to go into Babylon. Let's go to the points here. Have you ever heard about Daniel in the lion's den? Have you ever heard about the people Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Let's talk about them for a second. When they were invaded, they were forced to live in that culture. Somebody say Babylon. How are you going to live in Babylon? They had to live there. The first thing they did to these boys is they changed their names. The name Daniel has the name of God in it. El is judge. You know what they changed his name to? Belshazzar. Bel protects. They changed the name of the God. Do you see that? Bel was the name of their God. El was the name of our God. The next one's name was Hananiah. You know, the Yah at the end is the name of our God. Yah is gracious. But they changed his name to Shadrach, command of Aku, the moon god. Then they took the wonderful name of Mishael, which means who is El, asking that profound question, and changed it to Meshach, who is Aku. The first moment that these Christians or godly people came into that culture, they said, we're going to change your name and identity. Why didn't 
They just want to die at that moment. They're going to soon stand up unto death under the pressure of their culture. But why did they go along with changing the name? Because they understood in that time after losing the culture war that there's no point in fighting every little battle now. Don't fight every issue. And so we have to learn as much as I appreciate the baker who stands up and says, I don't want to do this and takes it to the Supreme Court. And I believe you can and should do those things. But just remember, you're making it more difficult in Babylon. Now, this is where some of my friends who want me to protest and start a revolution get a little disappointed with me. You see, my strategy is not to fight this thing out in the civil courts. My strategy is not to do it in the Supreme Court. I thank God, listen to me through those who do. But I find myself more like Daniel. You want to change my name from God is judge to now your God protects? Go ahead. Because I'm not fighting you over that. I'm not in Jerusalem anymore. And if I make an issue out of this, watch this, everybody, I lose my position. You see, what your organizations want to do is get you out of that position. They already know you're a Christian. They know you've been inviting people to the Bible study. And so they're just waiting. HR, your Department of Human Resources, is just waiting for you not to go along with the flow, fired. And now they're going to replace you with one of theirs. Hey, are you listening? We're going to get to a scripture by Jesus, but I think it's time that we start going along with the non-issues that are not the big ones. So take, for example, I'm driving Lyft. A guy comes in, fully looks like a dude, but he's got on makeup, and the name says Barbara. I have a choice. I can say, excuse me, sir, is this your ride? And then get put live on Facebook arguing with this guy about whether or not I have to call him Barbara, get fired from Lyft. Or I can say, Barbara, yeah, it's me. Okay. We're going over here? Yep, we're going over here. Start driving. How you doing, Barbara? Doing good. Awesome. Barbara, you want to know what I do for my day job? Yeah, sure. Tell me. I'm a pastor. Oh, really? What kind of pastor are you? That's what they always ask me. Conservative kind, follow the Bible. Oh, really? And they'll even ask me, what do you think about homosexuality? I think it's a sin. But guess what? He brought it up. You see, he brought it up. You see, I didn't lose my job because I had to make this a non, this issue, the issue right now, let's fight over. I'm so glad for the Jordan Petersons and others in politics getting things done in Supreme Courts and all of that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you and me on our jobs. We have a decision in our families. Are we going to fight over this? You see, I don't change what I believe. I'm still Daniel. You can call me Belshazzar all you want. I'm still Mishael. But you call me that, that's fine. But this is who I am. The second thing that we understand is that they asked for religious freedom when pressed with the minor issues. As they were getting their names changed, they wanted to change their diets. And Daniel humbly asked them and said, guys, you eat food that we as Jews are not supposed to eat. Would it be okay if we don't eat your food? Like, is it okay if I take a break to go pray? Or is it okay if I go and do this? And if they would have said negative, no, Daniel would have had to eat what they ate. But thankfully, these people compromised with them. You see, they negotiated over some minor issues. The next thing that happened was they helped the pagans succeed. Oh, this gets us so upset, especially those of us who have righteous indignation towards Apple and Google and Starbucks, all these places that hate Christians. Well, guess what? If you're going to work there, you're supposed to help them succeed. Now, listen to the other option. The other option is you can go live on a commune if you want. I grew up around the Amish. I know what that looks like. They drive horse and buggies. They farm their own land, and there is no problem with that. But if you want to be consistent in drawing the line over this, this, and this, you're going to have to draw the line a whole lot, baby. You're not going to use any corporate stuff that you don't agree with. You're not going to participate in any of the the governmental things that you don't agree with. You're going to find yourself living on a commune if you don't understand how to help pagans succeed. Because right now, Apple has a homosexual CEO. And if I walk into Apple quoting Bible verses on my job, they're going to fire me. And I will lose the opportunity to be a beneficial person there. But let's say I start to work at Apple and I bring success, just like David did in Babylon. And they start promoting me. And they start promoting me. And then one day, I become the Apple CEO. And at the end of the conference, after we crush the goals, I say, my greatest hero and the one I give thanks to for all of this is Jesus. See, what happened was I used their system to beat them at their own game. You must 
use their system to become successful. Otherwise, everybody look up at me. Teachers, your students miss your influence. Listen to me. Corporate leaders, your corporation misses your influence. All you police officers, military, those places miss your influence. If, if the Christians all leave every one of these places, what a disgrace that will be. You have to stay in Babylon for a time and be successful. Don't think I'm telling you to throw away your Christian beliefs, but learn to be successful in their system. Go to the last one, where you draw the line and you say, I will not compromise. Number four is when they ask you to worship or pray to another God other than your God. So that is your line. This was the line of Daniel and the boys right here. When Daniel was told that he had to stop praying, he kept praying. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told to bow down before a statue, they were thrown into a fiery furnace. You see, they knew the battle worth fighting. So your job says to you, you can't be a Christian here. Well, these boots were made for walking, and that's just what they'll do. One of these days, these boots are going to walk all over you. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. You, I can't be a Christian here. I'm done. But notice this. If you go into the story about Daniel in the lion's den, this is what they said about him, his pagan competition, his pagan enemies. They said, let's get Daniel out of the job here. He's taking all of the bonuses. He's getting all the promotions. So they go to the HR department and they say, come on, what do you got on Daniel? And they go, Daniel's the best. And then they say, well, maybe we can use his religion against him. And then they said to the leader, hey, let's make an edict right now that only you can receive prayer and see what Daniel will do. Make it illegal to pray to anybody else. And I love what the Bible says. It says, just like in days before, Daniel went to pray and they saw him praying and arrested him. I just love it because like he goes before his window or out in the, the porch area and he just says, I don't care what you all made a law for, I'm praying. And then they throw him in the lion's den. And even at this time, the king, he's upset because he really loves Daniel and realized he was tricked, but he's got to obey his law. When God does the miracle and Daniel comes out, he throws those treacherous people into the lion's den. You see, God is wanting you to be patient in the Babylonian system so that he can work this out for your good and for our good. Because if we all go broke right now and go live on a commune, we miss the opportunity to turn Babylon upside down for Jesus. It's not time to run and hide. It's now time to do what Jesus said. Now look at this scripture here. Go down, good sir. Thank you. We're ready for it. Matthew 10, 16 says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Does everybody get that? Now go back into early church history. What was he saying to them? You guys are about ready to get devoured out here. Did they not die for their faith? Did they? They gave their lives up for Jesus. And now we are in that same thing. But it's from the reverse now, right? We, you, the, the sheep used to be running the schools. The sheep used to be the majority of the culture. In the neighborhoods you grew up in, if you grew up 20 years ago like me, if somebody would have been smoking weed, they would have been the odd man out. Now, you not being down with weed, you're the odd man out. Does everybody get this? 20 years ago, lesbianism, homosexuality would have been the odd thing. Now, you're the odd one. And so this is what Jesus says. I am sending you like sheep among wolves. Get over it. It's coming. We lost the culture war, guys. The sheep are not running things. The wolves are. Now, watch the next thing he says. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. See, up until this point, you might have doubted some of my angles. Read that scripture and tell me what you think it means. It literally says you are in a dangerous environment. You are now like the Christians in China. The Christians in China can't run out into the street and go, I'm a Christian and I don't care who knows. As a matter of fact, listen to Gloria Copeland's daughter testify about the terrorist who died in Iraq, that Iranian terrorist. The Christians are celebrating because that man was killing Christians. 
These people were living under that oppression. Are you guys tracking with me? That's where we're headed if things don't change. You have to go underground. Now watch this. When he called the Jews snakes, he meant it in a derogatory term. Your snakes and your vipers. How is a snake or a viper a bad thing? The way it slithers and tries to, you know, to do things to hurt you and to be dirty about things. That's what he was calling them snakes and serpents for. But why does he use this for us? How many know snakes can sneak up on you? Sneaky snake. This is what Jesus is saying. Get up in there, in that culture. They don't even suspect you. You're just prospering. You're doing your work. And then all of a sudden, you strike. See, God is not telling us to run and hide. He's saying, yes, you are like a sheep among wolves, but you be shrewd. And then you be innocent. So nothing you do can be said against you. You didn't manipulate to get into power. You didn't uh, usurp authority, lie, cheat, and steal the way the others do. No, you came into CEO power. You came into entrepreneurship power. You became a governor. You became an alderman because you were so shrewd at what you did. And now you're here and able to strike the worldview of a Christian. Because does not the Bible want us to make disciples of the nations? Amen. Adam, would you come, please? Quickly in closing, my last list. Here it is. How can we do this? Tying it all together. I knew I would be on a lot of rabbit trails today. Thanks for sticking with me. Here's the way I would put it together. Number one, do not take on every battle. Let God pick your battles. You want to be out there right now picking every battle? That's okay. That's up to you. You have the freedom to do that. But listen, don't then play the martyr card because you weren't wise about it. If I go to a Cubs game wearing a White Sox jersey and every time the Cubs get struck out, I start cheering, is there any reason why they hate me? I mean, is it an odd thing why they hate me? No. See, in the world, they are against us. We know that. So if I just go right now to Boys Town and just start shouting that they're all going to hell and they spit on me, is that really suffering like Christ? No, because I have just purposely provoked them. But if I come out there shrewd with a microphone and then another microphone set up for them, and this is what we're doing now, by the way, with our gospel truck. And then when they get so mad and curse at us, if you watch our videos, it's our new tagline because we're going to be shrewd now. As they're cursing and getting mad at us, you know what we say? I thought you were supposed to accept us and love us. I thought you were supposed to be tolerant. So we put it right back on them. And then while they're leaving, we're always saying this tagline now. It sounds a little cheesy, but we're doing it for the eyes of the world to see we're hip to their game. As they're leaving, cursing us out, we go, we love you. And you might say, you're just patronizing them. No, we mean it because they want to make us look bad. We're going to be shrewd now. So imagine going to Belmont and Clark, another mic set up, Start preaching. And then anyone who disagrees, we go, come to the mic. Come to the mic. Let's have our discussion. Don't be angry in the sense you want to fight. Don't curse at us. Share your point of view. And then guess what? As they start coming up and cursing, we've had even sinners come to our defense and be like, why are you all acting crazy? You can't even discuss without getting mad? What's the point here? We're not as good as we think we are. You see, we need to be shrewd, wise, amen? Second thing, speak up in public when God leads you to do so. So you want to be that baker that doesn't want to bake the gay cake, or you, you want to be that Lyft driver that says, dude, I'm not calling a guy with makeup Barbara. I'm not doing it. Okay, that's fine. Just make sure God told you to do it because you're not going to have a job anymore. You're going to be going to the food kitchen, you know, the soup kitchen to get food. And that's okay. And if God told you to suffer that way, where God guides, he provides. But I want to make sure if we're going to have a Rosa Parks moment, if we're going to stand up on our job and go, I want the whole world to know. Make sure God told you to do that. Because Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not go around doing that. They were not like, hey, Babylonians, our God says you're all going to hell. Did you know that? I'm just going to remind you guys of that today. Nope, just like Joseph, Daniel, and the boys just went to work. Okay, what does Babylon need today? Okay, going to get it done, get it done. You do this, do this. Okay, we'll make, we'll make Babylon great again, even though it was the worst empire. 
Do you understand that? Some of y'all can't get over who's in office. I'm going to make America great whether Clinton's in, Obama's in, Trump's in, because I want America to be great. I want America to be great for my country's sake, for my children's sake, for your sake. So watch. A godly attitude is, I'll speak up what I need to. I'll, I'll let you know what I need to. Can I speak my mind? You know, that's a great one-liner to say in your business meetings or your corporate meetings. Can I speak my mind here? I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. This is what I believe. How do we go about this? You know, maybe they said for Pride Month, everybody has to wear the rainbow. Hey, uh, I'm not really uh, affirming that. I come from a Christian background. What do you want me to do? Well, you can wear whatever you want. I'm telling you, they'll make compromises. If they don't, just wear the rainbow and say God, God will judge or something, you know. <laughs> uh, number three, prosper wherever you go. We want to make them better. Number four, love people. Watch this. Love people where they are while you stay where you are. See, the world wants to say, I got to change to be where you are, to love you where you are. That is not true. I can love you where you are, right from where I'm at. You want to be in polyandry? That's cool. You're legal to do that. It's cool in that sense. I'm not going to get in your business. I picked up a guy one time, and he said, I'm having a bad day. I said, what's going on? He said, my wife found out about my girlfriend. And I said, well, what's she upset about? And then, and then he began to tell me, well, we've been doing wife swapping, and she didn't really like this one and this one and that one. I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm like, you want to know my advice? I'm a pastor. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, you should have one wife. Not swap around girlfriends, cause all this confusion. You know, I just start telling them what I thought. But, but here's the thing. I didn't have to, like, affirm his sin. I didn't have to say, that's cool, you live like that. No, I love you. You're cool. You're great. You're all, but I don't agree with every one of your decisions. And so you can just put it right back on them. Do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Do you agree with everything I do? No, I don't. I don't agree with everything you do. That's the same way I feel about you. I love you, but I don't agree with you. I'm right here. I love you, but you're right there. Now, what we do now in our belief systems is, is got to be in peace and love, but I'm telling you what, I'm not changing. I'll go, to, I'll go to heaven believing this, and you can go to hell believing whatever you want. Last thing, number five. People get nervous when we talk about hell, but I believe in hell. I wouldn't be here if I don't believe in hell. Do you guys get it? There are some churches that don't believe in hell. They're the biggest waste of time. If nobody's going there, what are we wasting time in here for? I mean, I know we can live for the glory of God and all that without all understanding all about hell. But if you think all roads lead to heaven, none's going to hell, then just do what you feel is best. Why are we learning laws then? It's a simple way to think, my friends. I believe in God's law, and I know people are going to be punished. That's why I talk about hell. And then for those of us who are in Christianity, I want to keep us on that path. And the last thing is, of course, don't worship anything other than God. Don't pray to anyone other than God. And here's what I hope for us. I hope in a year from now, we're in positions of authority where you can say, you know what? I'm making a difference where I work. They know I'm a Christian and they're starting to listen because the number one thing they would love for us to do is get out that job, be painted in the picture of being an ignoramus from the backwoods and don't know nothing, racist and hate mongers. That's what they would love to paint us as, you know? Like, we don't know science. Like, you actually don't believe we came from monkeys? Ha, 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 you're so stupid. That's how they want us to be. They don't want us to get our PhD in cosmo cosmology or our PhD in cosmetology. <laughs> they don't want us doing their makeup or talking about the stars. Are you listening? They, they don't want you to be a doctor. They don't want you to be a lawyer. They don't want you to be a teacher. They don't want you to be a CEO, but be one anyway. Go be one. Go be one. If the hippies could change the world and make it the way it is today, what can Christians do and make it in 60 years from now? See, I'm preaching this because I believe we can change Babylon from the inside out. We're here. We might as well make the best out of it and ask our God, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to do what only he can do, and that's to bring revival and to make us world changers, history makers, and roof breakers. If you believe it, will you stand up and shout amen? Come on. Somebody say amen as the band and altar workers come.